Good evening, students of British and American culture. Um, it is, this is technically week eight, although I already started week nine. And that is because um, we're doing the makeup lecture. I know it was uh, originally scheduled for, on, for the Saturday, just passed, but um, things get backed up a little bit when you're doing uh, 12 videos a week. So <clears throat> this one is supposed to be just one video. Um, it'll probably be quite long because of that. Before I get into things uh, about the Industrial Revolution and Imperialism, uh, I've gotten, we've done two assignments and I've gotten, I've received a lot of them, but some students didn't submit them or submitted them late. Uh, it's too late to submit any assignments when it's past one week. You have one week, you can be one week late. So I give you one week to do the assignment, and then if you're another week after that, you can still hand it in. But after that, it's too late. So um, you can't go back to lecture six or lecture five or four and realize that you didn't pay attention in the lecture. Uh, some, several students, just a few students, you know, mentioned that I didn't actually write when the second assignment was due on the website, but uh, that's, I mean, you should have adjusted by now, and uh, just like I have, and this is the most important thing. I've told you again and again, watch the video lecture, you have to watch the whole thing. I know these are long, some of them are over 30 minutes, but I chopped them down and separated them so that you could watch them and not fall asleep. So you have to watch the whole thing. That's part of the, the what it's like in class. In class, we would be sitting there for 50 minutes and take a break and then do another 50 minutes every Thursday. So you should be able to handle 35 minutes or 40 minutes in front of your computer. Drink a coffee or a Red Bull or whatever. And I'll try to be interesting. But uh, you have to pay attention to the whole thing. Uh, I do announce things in my lectures. So if you don't catch what I say, one, you're going to miss assignments. And two, you're not going to study for the exam very well. Uh, so today, let's get to it. We're going to talk about industrialization and imperialism. Now, the stuff on the board here is only about industrialization because I don't have a breakdown in this chapter about um, in, uh, about industrialization. So um, we'll do industrialization first, and then imperialism will be in the textbook. So first of all, I think the big question here is, everybody knows that, or if you didn't know, now you know, the, um, that the United Kingdom was the first uh, nation in the world to industrialize. And of course, we're dealing with British culture and American culture. So we have to ask the question, why did it happen there? What is, what was uh, the cause of the, the impetus for the Industrial Revolution, the causes of it, was that something that was um, unique to the United Kingdom? Was it something related to British culture? Or was the technology more advanced there? Or was it the political organization of the state? Um, I can't answer that question, but it's a question that we should ask and we should think about as we talk about this, because I think it was a combination of factors that's really too complex for us to decide that it couldn't have happened somewhere else. Um, but there, it was more likely to happen in the United Kingdom for a few reasons. And I, that's what I want to talk about is uh, how it, it was set in motion and uh, what were the factors, main factors that were involved, right? Uh, so this is the mid-18th century, and at this point, the, the um, English state has joined with the Scottish state and created the United Kingdom in 1707. So you have the Scots in the north, and you have the English in the south, and you have the, Whale, and you have the Welsh in the west, and then you have the Irish on their own island, and they're more of a colony and, and more of a... Uh, unwilling participant, even though some Scottish are not willing either, in, in the, you know, <clears throat> organization of the United Kingdom. So it's usually, uh, it was usually called the United Kingdom and Ireland, okay? So 
we'll get back to Ireland at some point again later. But for now, um, what you need to know is Ireland was not allowed really to participate in a lot of the things that happened except uh, at the bottom of society because basically it comes back to the religious thing that we talked about so much in the 16th century is that the Catholic, uh, the Irish are Catholic and they, that's part of their identity and it's part of their way of resisting English culture. So they, they will refuse to give that up and they will resist in every way possible, basically, um, the English control. So um, the, the English basically take over Ireland and they treat it like it's a colony. They rule it uh, as, a, as an imperial power. Um, so we'll talk about imperialism um, in the second half. I don't get, I want to get ahead of myself. Um, so the, the union that was formed between Scotland and England benefited both countries. The main problem for Scotland was that they lost their sovereignty. They lost the control they had over their own state. But they, they gained influence in the United Kingdom organization that was created. They got uh, membership in Parliament so that they could influence England, which the English thought that was fair. And uh, I'm not going to get into that because I'm half Scottish and half English and half Irish. That doesn't add up, but that's basically what I am. And I don't want to fight with myself. So, um, this situation where you had a very literate Scotland uh, with a Presbyterian church that encouraged public education um, and this union with England with uh, more access to markets and this, this big developed navy that went to war again and again with France and won or, or drew, but basically won five out of seven, you could say, uh, of these huge wars with France in the 18th uh, century, ending with Napoleon, <clears throat> which we'll talk about at the very end of this class, um, which in, it, get, it allowed the state to exert its political, economic, and military uh, power over a larger and larger amount of territory. So Ireland gets taken over first, and it's kind of like a dress rehearsal for the whole thing. And then it expands outward and it, they develop their American empire. And as you know, they, at the end of the century, they'll lose it. But when the Industrial Revolution is happening, they have it. So they have a source of, they have a source of uh, population, they have resources, and they have land, and they have communication, and they have economic power that um, only the Spanish, really, the French and the Spanish, but only other European powers have. So the only, I, I think, one of the factors that does cause the, the Industrial Revolution to get going is the fact that they, they have an empire. And uh, uh, the Chinese have an empire, and in India there's an empire as well, and there's empires in Africa, there's, there's empires everywhere, and there's an empire in Russia, but it's different because the way that you uh, have a sort of exponential economic growth, if, if, if you're not a gigantic land power like Russia or China with a lot of people, is by using water because you can, the transportation possibilities are so vast. So this, this um, there's a Dutch empire too that the English kind of take over um, through the course, of, through the years that we've been talking about. The Dutch Empire is more of the pro prototype for what the English do, and the British sort of take over from the Dutch in a lot of ways, especially in terms of how they do global trade. So that global trade is a huge, a huge advantage because this provides, for example, it provides access to technology, and the iron working technology that's necessary for making these machines that, that uh, are, are the backbone of the Industrial Revolution. Before that, you had machines that's not that machines are invented. It's just the machines are strong enough and they're larger and they can have moving parts that can be repaired and that, that are durable uh, in a way that they weren't before is because in Sweden, they started developing these new iron smelting technologies. So they... Don't get ahead of yourselves and say steel. Remember, it's not steel yet that they're using. Um, they're using iron, this iron smelting technology, and it's not stainless steel or anything that we'll have later. Um, this is big, heavy pieces of machinery, um, 
and there's bolts and screws and everything and they have big spinning pieces to them. They had these things before. For example, there's, there's water wheels and windmills all the way back to the medieval times. Um, but they're powered by nature and they're really unreliable. So the other thing that's really necessary for these machines to work is the material needs to be strong enough and have the, the right quality for it to, to be built and to maintain, to handle the stress of what this machine needs to do and to have the refined pieces as well, ever increasingly refined, um, you need to have this power source. Now, this is one of the biggest things about the Industrial Revolution is the increase in power. And you can see how we still have not forgotten um, where our power originally came from because the, you know there have been many revolutions in terms of technology. Agricultural revolutions are some of the most important because those revolutions allow population to grow and for cities to be fed and for and once you have cities and people concentrated in places you can develop all kinds of other things and this is what we call human culture is this really dynamic you know uh, diversification of labor and specializations of things that you can't you couldn't do when 95 percent of your people were pushing around tools trying to dig up the ground so there's lots of technologies that are created um, over the years and it's more of an evolution thing until you get to the point where you have a stable power source that can replace a human being or animal so the most popular animal of course to use right up until the you know the 20th century and World War One there were still thousands and thousands uh, in mil millions uh, in some gigantic uh, theaters of World War One that where these horses were used to pull things because uh, the automobiles were not, there wasn't enough of them and they weren't capable of pulling and being, uh, you know, going to, they needed roads that were really, really um, much better than the quality that was there. So, you know, it's still going to be hundreds of years before horses are actually fully replaced by trucks, right? In World War II, you've just got you got jeeps everywhere and trucks carrying everything and trains doing everything. Uh, but, you know, uh, for hundreds of years, 150 years at least, after the beginning of this Industrial Revolution, uh, the horses will still be important. So the way that you measure uh, how powerful an engine is, you, if you've never heard it before, when you buy a car or something you may, or if you watch a YouTube video or, or some sort of car show, you'll hear people say, well, this car is, you know, 200 horsepower, or this, this, is, this vehicle is 1,000 horsepower if it's really powerful, or something like that. And that means it's, yeah, that means that you, you would need 200 horses to get the same sort of power out of, um, out of an animal, out of a group of animals, as you do from one vehicle. So that just goes to show. The early vehicles and machines didn't have hundreds of horsepower, but they would be, you know, 10 times uh, more powerful um, very soon. And, and locomotives would get uh, way, way beyond what uh, even a, a, a car would now. So you're talking about hundreds of horses being able to pull something and not get tired, and it eats coal. Um, it, eats, it eats fuel. It doesn't need, which doesn't go bad, right? If you need to feed a horse, it's really expensive just to feed a horse because you need to feed it something that's not gone rotten. So you need grain and fodder, grass for a horse. And if you have a thousand horses, that's a lot of grass. But if you have a locomotive that you just feed it coal, you got a thousand horses that don't get tired and you can, you can move the same amount and get the same amount of power. So steam power, as you can see, was a, an essential part of the the uh, fact that one of the main factors that was necessary in order for this this leap forward in capac industrial production and capacity to occur. And the third main factor that I want to emphasize, you, get, you got your, so you have your machine, you've built it, and you need to power it, and now you need to make something with it. So the thing that drove the, the industrial revolution uh, for 
for a long time, even uh, into the American Civil War, which we're going to talk about in the next lecture this week. Um, there's, there's something called King Cotton, uh, is, which is a, a sort of political and economic strategy uh, because the American South, the economy, um, what, one of the things that they provide uh, to the northern states and to the British is enormous amounts of cotton that are grown on plantations. So uh, cotton from Egypt and cotton from India will feed the British Empire later, but it's America at the beginning that grows all this cotton in the American South. And this cotton gets turned into cloth, which we call the textile industry. So why is cloth the thing? Well, cotton is, um, I mean, we still wear cotton today, obviously, it's a pretty good material. Um, a long time ago, way, way back, uh, if you go back a thousand years or so, cotton is, is a very expensive material. We don't think anything of it because um, there was such a desire for it that um, it's exploded to the point where we have too much of it. But it was always, originally when the, the crop wasn't transplanted to the Americas and into India and Egypt and other places that would grow it, cotton was a very, very expensive um, uh, cloth. And compared to wool, for example, and we, we already talked about how the United Kingdom, the biggest um, commodity in the Middle Ages, in the medieval period that we talked about, um, the Black Death period and all that, the the main export from the United Kingdom, which was not the United Kingdom yet, from England and Scotland, was wool, right? Um, but people, the British found as they went around the world, the people in Egypt and South America and warmer countries do not want to wear wool. And when they went to China, they, they tried to exchange wool with the people in India and China and Asia, and they just didn't want to give them gold and tea and spices and silk for something that would just make them itchy, uncomfortable, and hot every day. Uh, so this cotton, this cotton product, the, the cloth made of cotton, became a huge, huge um, draw for, for money across Europe. And basically, the British, by moving the cottage industry of people, you know, spinning wool, and spinning thread from cotton in their in their um, homes or which was small house the cottage and moving it into the factory and increasing the production many many times over exponentially ten times a hundred times a thousand times more of this um, these textiles they uh, inf they f essentially flooded uh, the entire European market and started taking this um, selling it to everybody all over the world and this made an enormous amount of money and it that in turn started to feed into other obviously you you need all kinds of people uh, you need people to you know operate these big machines that that weave the threads like the original one was called the spinning jenny which is just a really small version of this these huge long things that they create eventually uh, and, it, and it spills over to all these under other industries it's just like the car industry but if you have a car, then you need to repair the car, and you need tires, and you need exhaust pipes, and you need, right, you need engine oil, and you need mechanics, and you need salesmen, and you need factories to assemble them, and, you know, you need insurance. But what I, there's all kinds of things that spin off. Uh, so when, you know, an automotive company goes bankrupt or collapses, um, usually the government tries their best not to allow that to happen because there's all these associated businesses that also go down with them. So even if it's only 100,000 people working for that company, I shouldn't say only, if there's 100,000 or there's 300,000, but then there's another 1 million or 2 million people that are involved in the automotive industry that, that uh, make, their li make their living through that. So um, there's all these other things that become associated with it. Um, that you need people to be captains of ships. You need crews for ships to move the cotton. You need to get the cotton from America and then you have to take it across the ocean and you have to take it to the textile mill and you need trains to move all the stuff and you need, so then you need to build train tracks. You can see 
uh, how this just drives the, the uh, British economy into a different level of development. And that's what happens in other countries now too. Uh, the British process was quite slow because they were the first and there was lots of experimental things. Uh, but that's what the industrial, that's why it's called a revolution even though it is slow. Because you can look at the beginning of the industrial revolution and you can say, okay, this is the end of the first stage and it's dramatically different. You've probably all heard the expression, the fourth industrial revolution and stuff, which is, you know, a totally different situation. I'm not saying the Industrial Revolution isn't still going on, but there's some distinct levels. I would say once you, once you go from coal and locomotives and feeding fires, and then you have like an internal combustion engine, like an automobile where there's gas, liquid gas going into pistons that drive your car, that that's a different, you're on, you're on, st you're on stage two then. That's the second industrial revolution, even though people don't usually call it that. Um, so that's, that's the basic characteristics of what industrialization is about. And I want you to remember those things. Uh, in the textbook, they, I do talk about this uh, and explain a little bit of it too. It's just not condensed like this. Now, I mentioned already, what are when we're thinking about why is British culture the part of the reason that it happens there first? Or is it British culture? Does British culture have anything to do with it? I would argue that it does. And I, just like I said, I don't, I'm not saying it couldn't have happened in France or it couldn't have happened in China or, or Spain, but it was more likely to happen in the United Kingdom first for a number of reasons. Um, <clears throat> some of these other countries have this, but the first thing that China doesn't have, for example, is the, the shipping capacity. The Chinese were not interested in, uh, they, they did actually send voyages out with huge treasure ships way before the you know, Europeans really got into the game. But they destroyed all those ships and decided to focus on, a, you know, they had an internal political strategy for hundreds of years. So they didn't have ships that could go to Europe and uh, America and bring, and and uh, trade internationally, they didn't have to in some ways because the Europeans all wanted to go to China. So China didn't really need uh, a shipping, a fleet full of ships because everybody was coming to them anyway. That's just my personal opinion, but it's true. Um, so the shipping capacity, the, the, the United Kingdom had the, the biggest merchant marine. Um, the Dutch had a bigger one in the previous century, by, but by this point, the English are taking overtaking the British are overtaking the Dutch and they have the, the most ships and they can transport more goods than anybody in the world right even the Spanish the Spanish still are bringing silver and gold and and communicating with their their colonies too but they're on the they're on the decline they're losing their political influence and their economic influence everywhere um, there's a lot of reasons for that but this is not called British American and Spanish culture so we'll stay away from them. But basically, as I said to you, the Spanish Armada and that disaster, it, we look at it now as the beginning of the sort of the, the curving of Spanish power, which it declines gradually to essentially to flatline into what we what Spain is today. It's it's not a first rate global power. It hasn't been it, for hundreds of years. Uh, they had their. And, I mean, the Spanish century really was the 16th century, so 1588 in the, the Spanish Armada was, it's a good point to, to just say, okay, that's where they started, um, they started to peak, and they're on their way down after that. So shipping, they have an advantage. The French are also a massive empire, but they, they lose the Seven Years' War, remember? So they lose Quebec, and they're eventually, soon, they're going to fight... Uh, the British, Napoleon's going to fight them, and he's going to lose as well on the sea, uh, and eventually on the land too. But on the sea primarily is the problem at initially. And when the British defeat the French and the Spanish on the sea in, in the Napoleonic Wars, then they have basically unchallenged supremacy on the sea. But this is after the Industrial Revolution. So, But anyway, they're, they're number one in shipping. They've got a lot of cheap labor. Part of this is because the agricultural revolution is taking hold and there's more 
food um, than there has been for the population in a long time. It's, you have to go back to, basically you have to go back to before the Black Death when you, there was a really good harvest and uh, the climate was a little bit warmer where England was producing more of a surplus of food which allowed uh, rapid population growth which was part of the reason, as I told you, remember this, and I, I, I think I reminded you already once in a previous lecture, don't forget that the Black Death was made worse by the overpopulation in England. It wouldn't have been as bad if people were not starving from bad harvests and overpopulation um, in the decades before the Black Death came around. Um, so, and the, there was a, there's a commercial revolution because going to war with France over and over again, seven times, as I mentioned, and they lost once. Um, they go to war with them over and over again over various issues, some of it's religion, some of it's political, some of it's related to claims by kings and queens, and some of it's, you know, uh, a struggle for, for, you know, top, you know, um, control over over the oceans and the, the sea lanes and the, the land of Europe, um, over, over resources and, and uh, the, in direct competition with each other because they're only 20 kilometers apart at the narrowest point. So France and England um, fight sort of not, I wouldn't, some people say they fought to the death, but we don't mean death of all the people, we just mean they fought each other until the one of them collapsed. And when, French, when France collapsed, it was um, just before the British were probably going to collapse too. The only way that the British could compete, uh, because France had a larger territory and um, a larger population at the time, was by a commercial revolution. So they started um, using corporations instead of individual and they basically feudalism really starts to break down here we already talked about the chain of being and everything the chain of being is long gone but the you know the hierarchy of positions and the feudal contracts and everything that's still happening in france and there's taxes on everything and it's very complicated all the rules that you have to follow and who you're who you have to be responsible to and who you have to do um who you owe allegiance to and where you're allowed to go and what you're allowed to do. There's lots of, um, there are huge consequences to this when uh, the Re French Revolution happens. And there's some of that in England too, but it's different because England starts to, the United Kingdom, the Scottish and the English start to make companies and they start to have what they call uh, joint stock ventures where everybody invests together and you, you put part of your money in it and then you sort of absorb the risk with a group of people, rather rather than like having one or two or partners or just a, in a single person just trying to fund the entire thing with their own wealth, and then if they fail, it's all gone, right? Uh, it's it is it's a way of managing risk. And there's they create the Bank of England, which is still around today. The Bank of England manages loans and credits, and it helps it loans money to the government. The government can borrow money from a bank. No, none of this was possible before. So they are actually, the British, even though they're smaller and they have less people to tax and they have less wealth and land and resources than the French do, um, in many cases, they are able to um, spend, outspend uh, France um, through this commercial revolution. So they have the commercial system in place. Now you can see, basically France has all these things too. And this is why I say British culture is kind of a part of it, too, is because for whatever reason, um, in France, when they started making these machines and the, the owners and investors attempted to uh, start their factories and their, their businesses and, and get the industry going, um, the, people, um, the people in France who, who were involved in cottage industry were fearful for their jobs in the same way that we are fearful of losing our jobs to robots, right? So you see this actually, um, and again, I'm, I'm trying to point these things out to you because some students have wondered, they're not uh, being 
cynical or, or critical of, of the lectures and just saying, well, why are we studying all this old stuff? But they're just curious. I've got emails from students saying, well, well how, how does this relate to, uh, why did you say that? Like, why is America similar to now or why is British? Well, um, there's a lot of things that are similar because the Industrial Revolution, any Industrial Revolution causes a lot of changes in what kind of labor you need. And that's why it's revolutionary. So when you suddenly can't do your job in your house, in your small piece of land, and you move to the city and you start working in a factory, um, there's a lot of things that change. And they're not all positive. Um, I think it's, I, it's <laughs> a lot of you like cities, but you like modern, you like Korean cities now that are clean, they have public transportation, they've got movie theaters and shopping malls and norebang and everything, right? But the cities in England didn't have that. They were disgusting. They were dirty, they were overpopulated. Uh, there's sewage everywhere, there's smoke and coal smoke everywhere, and they're full of disease. The, the, the buildings are not you know, built very well, and you've got a tiny room, and everybody's noisy and drunk all the time. This is not, it would be like living in the very worst part of any city. Um, and that would be the whole city, essentially, right? It would just, it's just a, a different type of city. It's not anything like we have now. We, we've, we've gone way, way past what cities were when the Industrial Revolution was, was a, you know, a new thing. Uh, so the French people seemed more resistant. So they smashed, whenever somebody tried to make a factory in France, I shouldn't say always, but essentially all the people in the area would get together with their pitchforks and their sticks and their fists and they would, you know, go into the, the new factory at night and, and smash it to pieces. And that prevented things from going very quickly. So eventually France will industrialize, but there was a lot of public resistance to it. And that's a cultural thing. There's, there's too many, again, I said, there's too many, you know, it's too complex for me to break down exactly all the reasons, but these are some of them. So, so those are some of the reasons that, that uh, this, this thing started in um, British culture in the United Kingdom, and then it spread to other countries uh, fairly quickly after other countries realized what, what the advantages were, right? Like money, um, production, competition, and uh, military power, right? You can um, move equipment and people and you can build, instead of making textiles, the Industrial Revolution will allow people to make guns faster. Uh, and to make bullets for them and to make boots and helmets and everything else that's required in order to make war. So industrial war is a very scary thing and that's because you can make equipment and make war much much bigger and more in, in a more dangerous way and we'll get to that too in the 19th century which is down the road a couple of lectures. So now um, imperial rule. When I when I did my lecture on Henry VIII, the 16th century, um, weeks ago, I neglected to tell you something that's probably important. Uh, it's a small detail, but it's an important one. When, when Henry decided to um, form the Church of England and become the head of the church and the state, he declared that England was an empire. Now you say, okay, whatever, you can declare that, and what does that mean? Well, if you're Korean, uh, the last king of the Chosun, I believe, if he's not the last king, then it was one before him. Uh, one of the last kings of the Chosun, before the Japanese invaded, he declared that he was the emperor of Chosun. It's the same country, it's the same size, and, and uh, there's not more people or necessarily more power. Um, that's not the point. The point really is the location of the power, that um, there's, if you say you're an emperor rather than a king, in England it meant that um, he had absolute authority, what the Romans referred to as imperium, which is where we get the word uh, imperial from, and emperor and empire. Um, imperium is that location of political, military, economic, 
power in an individual. And so in Rome, they would give this, if you were going to be the governor of, uh, there's different names in Rome uh, for governors, but if you were going to be the, the ruler of a certain province, right, um, they, they have different names, proconsul or something like that, uh, you get this title, and in that area, you have absolute authority to do what you want, and nobody can stop you, right? You don't need to take a vote or something like that. You don't need to go to Parliament and say, Parliament, please give me some money so I can do something. So that was, I mean, part of the deal is that Henry VIII wanted to declare that England was completely separated from the Pope because the Pope was really the religious descendant of the Roman Emperor. So in a way, the Pope would claim spiritual and religious authority, and in some ways it would encroach in political authority as well over all the people. In, as I told you, like the chain of being, the Pope is at the top, but the king wants to be at the top as well, or above the Pope. But the Pope is never going to want to do that. So essentially, he needed to get rid of the Pope, and the way that he did that with the legal language is to, to declare that England was not a part of the, it was completely separated, it was an empire like the Holy Roman Empire. And the Holy Roman Emperor uh, was always fighting with the Pope about who was the more powerful one. So uh, he's really just following this long tradition of trying to locate all of the, the power in himself so that he can be an absolute ruler. And he doesn't have to listen to the Pope, doesn't have to listen to Parliament, doesn't have to listen to his advisors because he's an absolute ruler. And that's the reason why Thomas More wrote Utopia, because he didn't like it. He was Catholic, and he didn't think anybody should be a tyrant, even the Pope. But he thought that the Pope did have um, jurisdiction over English people, just like he had jurisdiction and, and influence over any person who was European and who was Christian. So, <clears throat> that's where we get down to this point where we're talking about uh, you know, the British Empire being born. When exactly is it born? I don't know how to say that exactly. Everybody has a different idea. Um, you, you can't just say just because somebody said it that it's a real empire. I mean, just like I said, Henry VIII said it, the last Chosun Emperor said it. It didn't really have a lot of effects outside, you know, the domestic situation. But when you have a real empire, my, my opinion is that a real empire, the, the biggest consequences are external, right? That outside of your national boundary, people are affected. And that's why I said, although the Americans hate imperialism, and that's why they broke away from the British Empire, the, the, the power that the American state has over so many countries and territories around the world is in a sense, imperial, because the, they, they have the ability to just tell other countries what to do, and if they don't do it, they send an army there, and they make them do it. That's imperialism. I'm sorry, but you can call it whatever you want. You can call it uh, hyper-interventionalism. You can call it uh, expansionism. You can call it uh, messing around in other people's business, but that's what it, empires do. Uh, they do things outside what people would consider their borders to be. And they, they do it constantly. Uh, and they colonize things. And colonialism is not the same as imperialism, but there's often, uh, colonialism is a, is a means of exerting imperial influence. So this is what I wanted to say to you. This is what happens, and this is where the Irish thing comes in, uh, finally, is how Ireland is treated. So, like I said, in a way, you could say that the flight of the earls um, is, the, is the beginning of the British Empire. But you can also say that way back when William the Conqueror took over England, and then he still had Normandy, um, and then they, they got a hold of Anjou, and they got a hold of, other, of, of Brittany and other parts, of, and Burgundy became their allies, and they took over the Welsh, and when, when the British... Uh, when the English state had taken over Wales and possessed half of France, that it was an empire then too. But anyway, this is the British Empire, and the British Empire is 
where you know this idea of of a single people composed of all these different groups, especially the Scottish and the English and the Welsh, um, that all of them are British. They're individually a certain thing, but uh, collectively we can refer to them as British. Now, a Scottish person or an English person or, or a Welsh person might not like to be identified as British, but if you're actually uh, from another country originally, uh, let's say you're from Pakistan or you're from Canada, uh, and you live in England, you might be more comfortable calling yourself British than English because British implies a, more of a multicultural concept, right? But anyway, we won't get too sensitive about that. I'm just going to refer to them as British when I refer to the whole thing. And I'm never going to refer to the Irish as British because they didn't want to be at any point referred to that, uh, so I won't. There's Northern Irish and there's Irish. But they're not British. Yeah, there's, there's something called the Scots-Irish as well, but let's just keep it simple. Ireland was the first victim of the British Empire, and they continued to be victimized. And the British always focused on them because, in a way, they had a Catholic power right behind them. So whenever they were dealing with France, there was a potential for Ireland to threaten them yeah, you know, and, and sort of trap them or attack them from two sides. So they were sort of paranoid about the Irish. And uh, they still should be blamed for all the things they did, but that's what they were concerned about. Um, so there's obviously a lot of bad points. Um, I'm not trying to sell imperialism because I think it's a terrible thing, but I did make a list of what basically imperialists, like Winston Churchill, for example, and there's, there are many, many imperialists over the years in many different countries uh, that try to justify these things. You can even... Uh, listen to interviews of um, current managers of the British museums. And I've been to the British museums. You, they're all free. You can go in and look at them. There's the, War, the Imperial War Museum and there's the National Art, the British Art Gallery and um, the British Museum, the Royal British Museum, all these different museums that they're all around um, but near down the street from Buckingham Palace, all in the same sort of neighborhood. They're all free. They're fantastic. But a lot of those things, a lot of the things that are in the museum uh, were taken from other countries. And if you, if you see interviews of these curators, these old guys, uh, French, and there's French similar things in France with all the things that the French higher empire sucked back into France that don't really belong there because they weren't purchased, they were just taken. The way that they justify... <laughs> having those things and not giving them back to the original country, right? Like not giving Egypt back its mummies or not giving Iraq back, you know, the Babylonian artifacts or something like that they, because they think they're more capable of protecting them and that if they give them back to the country where they came from, that they would be destroyed or they wouldn't take care of them or they don't deserve them. That sounds like imperialism too. So that's kind of the way that imperialists justify it is that we are more developed than you, so therefore we should, and we're more powerful than you, so therefore we, we should do this, and you should, you should be okay with it, all right? So this is, this is the list here, um, the, the arguments in favor first. Um, creating global, global peace, excuse me, creating global peace by being the only su superpower is one of the things that they did. Um, I'm going to talk about Nelson in a sec. So after Napoleon is defeated, basically the British are not challenged by anybody seriously on the oceans for about 75 years, more than 75 years. The Germans eventually start to do it at the end of the 19th century, but it's over 75 years where nobody wants to pick a fight with them. So they can patrol, they can control international you know, transportation and uh, trade over the water by being some sort of like uh, international police force, world police. Um, they can provide protection to their colonies. That's one of the things the Americans didn't want to give up was that they did, you know, in the Seven Years War, the British military uh, paid the soldiers and sent uh, military equipment and soldiers and, and officers and fought against the French. And the Americans supplied people too, but they were members of 
It was all handled by the British, by the home country, not by the colonies. And that's why they were so, they didn't really want to pay for it. And the, the British Empire said, you have to pay for it, some of it, because we were helping you and you didn't pay for it. And that started the whole revolutionary war thing. Okay, um, they keep the sea lanes open and they protect people from pirates. They share technology and advances in science, education, and philosophy to these different places. And they provide access to art and literature and the most sophisticated civilization in the world, in their opinion. Um, what would we do without our Shakespeare? And I love Shakespeare, but you shouldn't force people to study Shakespeare. Um, they need to come around to it on their own. So, <clears throat> the English Bible, the King James Bible, is a good example of that too. Um, all the missionaries and stuff, it's Christian stuff, but it's also... Yeah, and there's this, an imperial mechanism there when you're sending people to other countries to try and convert them. Um, part of the reason is because you believe religiously, and some of them are, some um, missionaries are very um, generous, charitable people, but there's always these people that are really trying to um, exert influence and control uh, over other people as well. So, the, the downside, the negative side, which is the, the stuff that I usually focus on, especially because in Canada, we were part of the British Empire before, and so we took this um, attitude and this policy um, and, and used it practically on the native people. So a lot of the worst things that Canada has done as a culture and as a nation in its history were done to the native people, and it was the justification for it was they don't know how to take care of themselves, they're undeveloped, so we're going to take their children away from them and educate them in the way that we think they should be educated. It's pretty, it's pretty terrible stuff. And uh, Koreans can identify with that very easily because the Japanese used the same sort of policy when they were occupying the Korean Peninsula, you know, um, for 35 years, from 1910 to 1945. So these are the lists of uh, demerits, but I should say it's they're really more like crimes. Uh, they take local resources and they tax the people and they tax uh, goods, which is this is the primary thing that the Americans uh, went to war uh, with the British Empire about was taking the resources and taxing our stuff. Um, obviously, a foreign government controls your state by the presence of military garrisons. That was made. Boston freak out and the Boston massacre and the Boston Tea Party and everything else is because um, no taxation without representation, right? Uh, so the, the territory has no self-determination as a sovereign state. They don't have power over themselves. Um, there's no political representation in British governments. And <clears throat> they have to make sacrifices with their native language. Blue screen of death. I haven't seen that in a while. <clears throat> that, that means my computer just crashed. Uh, a lack of political representation in the British government, sacrifice of native languages. Um, this, all this stuff happened in Korea, and all this stuff happened in Ireland as well, um, over a much longer period of time, centuries in Ireland. So most Irish people speak English as a first language, and if they know Gaelic, their the Irish language, which many of them do, it's, it's something that they studied um, because their family took interest in it, but in school, uh, in, in their jobs and everything, they use English, which would not have happened were it not for an imperialist policy. So the, here's another thing I said. Like I said, a lack of recognition of the value and importance of culture, art, music, or designs that are not British or European. So yeah, they, you know, they think the Mona Lisa, you can't put a price on the Mona Lisa, but on a... 500 year old uh, African sculpture, you can buy that for a, a, th a few thousand dollars. But if you wanted to buy the Mona Lisa, it would, you'd have to trade an, an entire country for it. That's just completely um, insane. But um, there is this scale of what things, um, how valuable things are, and it's totally out of proportion. And, of course, there's creation of laws enforced by the foreign imperial power. So you have to follow the laws of the United Kingdom. Uh, you, you can't operate under your own laws. So that is imperialism. So that's industrialization and imperialism. I do want you to read the last part of the chapter, too, because 
the Navy is such an important, the Navy, excuse me, the Navy is such an important thing. Um, recently, the British Navy has sh shrunk, and it's mostly because the, nobody can compete with the Americans anyway, so what's the point? The, the only reason that the British would have a bigger Navy is so that they could control the oceans um, and take control from somebody else, but they're really not going to do that with the Americans because of the special alliance anyway. Um, so they've, they've just cut and cut and cut until it's almost gone. Um, but a hundred years ago, and people still think the British Navy is invincible, even though they don't even have an aircraft carrier. Um, so the, the reputation is well earned though, because for hundreds of years they were pretty much unstoppable. Uh, if you go to London, you should go to Buckingham Palace and Westminster Hall and the museums I've talked about and in the, in the you know, plaza where the museums are, there is this statue with a huge pedestal that goes up, I don't know, 50 feet or something. And on top of it is um, a man named Horatio Nelson. And Horatio Nelson has one arm and he's staring out, um, looking in the direction of France um, to represent the victory at Trafalgar. And that's the name of the square. The statue was there, made there to commemorate the victory of the British Navy over the combined Spanish and French fleet at Trafalgar, where Nelson defeated um, the opposing admiral and died in the process. Uh, it's really a similar, it's not, I shouldn't say it's similar, but it's, it's, a, it's a story of, of bravery and commitment to, to um, a national interest um, and, and a, a story of a certain personality um, who, and then the, per, the, what am I trying to say? He has a, he's a strategic genius and a tactical genius and he has the, the warrior qualities to him. He, um, Nelson was supposedly a very proud and difficult man to um, get along with and he had this really turbulent affair with Lady Hamilton um, who was not his wife, um, he was somebody else's wife. Um, and he, he was very, I guess he was very passionate, he was very romantic, and he was, but he was not afraid of dying. He was shot multiple times, he lost his arm, um, he died from being shot by a sniper in the Battle of Trafalgar, and that does remind you a little bit of Isun Shin, right? Never loses a, a battle, um, he is uh, fearless, and risks his personal life um, in order to participate actively in each battle. And uh, as a consequence, Isun Shin also um, gets shot by a Japanese, I, I'm assuming he was a sniper, Japanese uh, warrior uh, shoots him with a gun, and uh, that's how in Noryang, if I got that name right, I hope I did, uh, there's a lot of different battles that Isun Shin fought, but his, the last battle when he's pursuing the Japanese uh, in the ocean, he, he is shot and he expires. Similar results with Nelson. They're very, in some ways they're very similar, in some ways they're not. Personality-wise, they're completely different. Um, now, Nelson fought in um, the early 19th century. This is uh, when imperialism really starts to take hold, that the British Empire is this superpower that can stand up to France. And they don't stand up to France alone, let's be honest. The French, I, they, it takes pretty much every powerful country around France working together to beat France. But on the water, it's just the British against the French. And on the water, the British win. And that is key. If Nelson had not done that, there wouldn't be a British Empire. There would not have been a British Empire. Now there's not. Um, so Nelson is a legend, and uh, for his funeral, w when he died, there was a procession that went through, you know, the southern part of the country, and millions of people came out <clears throat> to see the parade and watch him, and, and there was, I mean, the people were, all of his um, soldiers and crew were just completely depressed and, and um, shattered by his death, just like, I'm sure, um, Isun Shin's men were too. So there's a section at the end there that talks about um, Admiral, Lord Admiral Horacio Nelson 
and uh, the HMS Victory. So uh, that you can see there's a little section about Queen Victoria there. Um, that's not going to be on the exam. Uh, you should be following all the stuff I do in the video lecture. And um, if you've gotten through this whole lecture, then I can just tell you this. I, I never ask questions really about Queen Victoria because it doesn't fit in. And it, again, this happened this this semester that it just doesn't really fit into anything what we're going to talk about in this lecture or the next one. So it's there. She's very important. Uh, the whole era is called the Victorian era, but I want to focus on the American stuff now. So, um, sorry, Queen Victoria, you're not going to be on the exam. Okay, so you don't have to worry about page 146 and 147 because I didn't cover that and it doesn't fit in very well. And that's the end of the chapter. That's the end of chapter 5. So <clears throat> we'll move on to chapter 6 after we finish talking about the American Civil War, which is the second and third part of this week's lecture. So that's it. Makeup lecture is done. No more makeups. That's it. Um, there is a holiday this week, but I said, as I said, we're just going to plow right through it and just pretend you, um, you probably don't watch the videos always on Thursday. You watch them whenever. So we don't need to worry about holidays. We're just going to go straight through to week 14 and then we will see each other finally in the exam.